Hello, this is National Master Charles Campbell and I'm back again with yet another powerful chess video. Students sometimes ask me, are there any rules for playing the endgame? Some have winning endgame positions and don't even know it. In this video, I will demonstrate how to identify a winning endgame and also offer some endgame tips. If you've always had problems with converting your advantage in the endgame, or you don't know what plans to follow, this will be of immense help. So make yourself comfortable and pay attention. Generally speaking, the end game is that phase of the game when the number of pieces on the chessboard have significantly reduced due to captures and exchanges. Sometimes it is difficult to distinguish between the middle game and the end game, especially when a series of rapid captures may have occurred but some key concepts stand out. Pawns, past pawns especially, become more important as they threaten to march down the board seeking promotion. Advantage is gained by the control of open or half open files, diagonals and key squares are often magnified and combined to complete dominance. Also, the king which has remained passive and in need of protection all through the game emerges and is suddenly transformed into a monster dictator as he marches down the board to prey on weak pieces and weak squares. There are many factors to consider when you play in an endgame, but these are my top six tips. If you master these tips, you will definitely have better results in your games. Tip 1. The king is a fighting piece. Activate it. This statement was credited to William Stennett, the past world champion. Everybody knows the king is the most important piece on the chessboard, and as such, we strive to protect it with all we've got. In doing this, we try to keep the king out of the line of fire, out of action for a long time. However, when the game starts drawing closer to the end game, the king actually most of the time joins in the battle and leads from the front. The game I'm about to show you was played by the great Alexander Aliokin, some people say Alekhine, against Frederick Yates in 1922. It's an old game, but in terms of instructiveness, in terms of incisiveness and being able to serve as a tool for learning, you could find very few games that match this game. In this position, Alekhine playing white was to play. And so the game continued. King f2. He's trying to get the king into the game along the dark squares. Notice how he controls the c-file completely with his rooks, dominating possession. Yates plays a waiting move, king h7. Now Alekhine starts with the expansion on the king side with h4. He's trying to hem the black king in and make the black pawns on g7 and h6 immobile. Rook f8, another waiting move which achieves nothing. King g3, the king starts its journey towards the center on the dark squares. Rook goes back, another waiting move. Now the rook enters the fray and directly focuses on the king by pinning the king on h7 to the pawn on g7. Bishop move, a move which achieves nothing, but of course he had to play. So the second rook comes in. Already you can see what White's plan will be. He's trying to get both his rooks actively involved in the game in conjunction with this monster knight on e5, which completely dwarfs its counterpart, the bishop on b5. Bishop goes back. Now the rook comes in systematically attacking the bishop, which is defended, but most importantly, attacking the pawn on e6. The rook is also ready to switch over from the queen side to the king side where the king is. Rook defends the pawn. The king continues its march on f4. King goes back. h5. I love this move. This move completely hems black in and makes sure that none of these pawns can move. If this pawn moves, white has the option of capturing on passant. Bishop attacks the pawn. Of course, White decides not to give up that pawn. Bishop goes back. 
Now we enter the final stage of the attack. Pay attention. Rook goes to f7. What does he want to do? Naturally, he wants to place both his rooks on the 7th rank so they could attack g7 pawn simultaneously. King goes back. The other rook comes in and of course there's only one move for black to play. He's got to defend. Now the knight comes in threatening to play knight f6 check. Black runs away with the king and white goes there all the same. Of course pawn takes knight is impossible because rook to h7 would be mate. Rook attacks the rook. Now watch this. This is beautiful. Rook takes pawn. White sacrifices his knight on f6. Black takes the knight and the coup de grace. White plays a silent slow move which completely paralyzes black. Black is forced to resign because checkmate is imminent on h7. Tip 2. The power of a passed pawn. Philidor was quoted as saying, the pawn is the soul of chess. However, the great Aaron Nimzowicz raised the bar considerably higher with regards to passed pawns. He said, and I quote, the pawn is a criminal who should be kept under lock and key. Mild measures such as police surveillance are not sufficient. <laughs> Quite funny, eh? He also went ahead to propose the blockade, attack and destroy theme for dealing with past pawns. The game we're about to review is a game between Peter Svidler, the great Russian grandmaster, and Jan Smits. Let's enjoy the game and see how it moves on. Now with Svidler to play, Svidler was white. He mobilized his queenside majority by playing a4. Smith brought his king closer to the center in preparation of the, for the end game. White continues his mobilization towards creating a passed pawn. He has two pawns on the queen side, the B pawn and the A pawn, and black has just one pawn. So what's his plan? His plan is simple. Liquidate the pawns, end up with one pawn on the queen side, which would eventually queen on the light square supported by the bishop. It's a very, very, very important strategy we must remember. When you have a bishop that controls the queen in square, the pawn becomes considerably stronger. So, Smith decides to exchange off the bishop. And Fiddler obliges by capturing the bishop. Smith pins the knight to the rook. Fiddler is not to be deterred. He continues with his strategy of creating a passed pawn on the A file by playing A5. Smith captures. Fiddler captures. Now, Smith continues mobilizing his knights, taking advantage of the fact that the knight is pinned to the rook. So he plans to possibly attack the knight so he could capture the rook if the knight moves away. Svidler continues his resolute in his purpose. Finally, the knight pins the knight. But look what Svidler does. He completely ignores that move and plays a7. Why? Because if knight takes knight, Svidler would simply play rook takes knight. And if the rook takes, the pawn queens. The rook is forced to go behind the pawn. Svidler captures the knight. King takes and the rook dominates on the seventh rank with a check. King moves. Now he brings his king closer to the center. Svidler plays. Smith plays. Now Svidler continues with his king towards the center. Smith continues advancing his pawns, trying to create a passed pawn on the king side. It's a race. King comes closer. Now Smith continues. Fiddler goes towards the pawn. He goes towards his strongest point in the game, which is the pawn on a7. The passed pawn is really strong and will cost at least an officer for black to get rid of it. Smith continues trying to create his own counter passed pawn on the king side. Fiddler continues by also making sure the king doesn't come close to his pawn or his rook. 
Now a king goes to the king's side. The fiddler goes to defend his pawn to free the rook. Smith continues, captures, he captures. Now Spindler attacks the rook. Naturally, the rook has to move. So the rook captures the pawn. King captures. Now king goes over to the king's side to try and get rid of the pawn so one of his pawns can queen. Spindler plays a brilliant move which cuts off the king. Now f3 cuts off the rook. Now king starts getting closer. King goes to attack the h-pawn. King's closer. And so black resigns. The black king is no match for the strength of the white rook and the white king. The king and the rook would eventually gobble up all the pawns and mates would follow. Tip 3. Gaining the opposition. When two kings face each other with a square between them, the player not having the move is said to have gained the opposition. In our featured game, Fritz Riemann demonstrated this theme to perfection in one of the very few victories he had against Adolf Anderson. The stage was 1878. I like these old games because most of the themes are clearly demonstrated in their purest forms. So here we have the game. Anderson has just captured Riemann's rook on b4 with his king. So it's Riemann's turn to move. He immediately seizes the initiative and gains the opposition by playing his king to b6. Notice that the king is one step away from the white king and it is white's turn to move. The black king is on the dark square and the white king is on the dark square with the light square in between. White must move. As it stands, white has lost the opposition and black has gained the opposition. Anderson plays his king to c4 goes to the white square. Now it's Riemann's turn to move. For Riemann to maintain the opposition, he must go to a square of the opposite color to the square that the white king has gone to. The white king has gone to the white square. So Riemann has to go to a dark square. And that square is a5. So Riemann plays king to a5. Note that the white king cannot go to c5 because if the king goes to c5, the pawn simply comes to b5 and the pawn marches down the board. So Anderson is forced to play king to b3. In order to maintain the opposition for black, what would be his best move? Fantastic. It's king b5, staying one step away from the white king and forcing white to make a move. Anderson plays king to c3, and based on the sequence of moves we've had initially, what would be Riemann's best move? Yeah, staying on the opposite color to the color that the white king has gone to. The white king has gone to a dark square, so Riemann stays on the light square. At this point, Anderson decided he had had enough, and he resigned. Tip 4. The principle of two weaknesses. Sometimes in chess, one weakness is insufficient to cause your opponent to resign or to force a checkmate. You need to create another weakness in another part of the board for you to be able to actualize your potential on the board. In this game that we'll be reviewing right now, the legendary Bobby Fischer played against Mark Timonov in 1970. He was a Sicilian. And we have a position as presented here. White's next move was to capture the pawn on f4. Note that black has one, two, three pawn islands, especially the d6 pawn, which is very, very weak. This d6 pawn is identified quickly by Fisher as the first weakness, and he goes after it with all he's got. So, the knight chased the queen away, and the queen moved. The queen comes to c7. 
Fisher throws his knight into d5, dominating the squares, attacking the key dark squares around the black camp. The queen moves away with a check. King moves. Bishop attacks the knights. Now, black intends to get rid of that troublesome knight as quickly as he can. The rook goes up, threatening to switch to the king side. The knight moves to g5. Bishop defends the pawn on e4. Bishop takes knight. Rook takes knight. Now, rook takes bishop, continues to apply pressure on the weak d6 pawn. Queen goes back. Now, e5. Now, this is an, an example of a liquidation which leads to one more advantage. Pawn takes pawn. He takes with the queen. Now, that's a surprise. Why did he do this? He has noticed the weakness of the b6 square, of the b6 pawn, and he wants to go after it with all he's got right now. Rook moves. Bishop there. Now, the bishop is simply controlling all of the light squares around the black camp and making black feel very uncomfortable. Queen takes queen. Rook takes queen. Now g6 attacks the bishop. Where does he go? He doesn't go anywhere. He tries to get rid of the knight, which is also controlling some key squares in the white camp. Knight goes back. The bishop retreats. Knight attacks the bishop. Of course, the bishop goes to f3, controlling that long diagonal. Rook goes. Finally, the rook goes to where it's wanted to go all along. Pinning the b6 pawn to the rook. Rook attacks the pawn. Pawn push. That's a pin. Rook takes pawn check. King moves. Rook begs the rook. Rook takes. Pawn takes. Rook attacks the pawn. Pawn takes. Pawn takes. Now, what has happened? White has created a dangerous and wicked passed pawn on the a-file. Note that the bishop is a light square bishop and it also controls the queen in square. That's very, very important. King up. The pawn starts to roll. Rook back. Rook up attacks. Now rook goes behind the pawn. That's normal. Rook always goes behind the passed pawn to support it. Rook there. King up. Knight there. Pawn push. The rook has to go behind the pawn. King up. Knight there. Attacking. Now bishop comes in between the rook and the knight. Disconnects them. Knight goes. Now the rook stops the knight from coming to c5. <clears throat> king up. King moves. King moves. King moves. Rook check. King there. King takes b4. At this stage, time enough knew he had a lost position and so he never bothered to continue. He resigned. Tip 5. Transformation of advantage. Sometimes you might have to transform your advantage into some other form in order to actualize the win. I learned this the very harsh way from Grandmaster Johansen at the 2010 World Chess Olympiad, where in this position, as black, he played knight takes pawn. I was shocked, but I believed he was going to take a pawn and take two pawns for his knight, so I captured back. But this move really got me totally lost and I knew I was completely lost after g3. I resigned a few moves later and it made a huge impression on me. And now for the sixth and final tip. Tip six. Study basic checkmate patterns and motives. Nothing could be more embarrassing than having a winning position and you don't know how to checkmate. So you must go back and study all the basic checkmate motives. Queen and king against king, rooks against king, bishops against king. You must study all of them in order to come out tops. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. I hope to see you soon. Take care.